Hi, good evening. Tonight we welcome poet Keith Flynn. Keith is the award-winning author of seven books, including his latest collection of poems, The Skin of Meaning, which came out in April. He has appeared in many journals and anthologies all over the world. He's also received numerous prizes, including being named the Gilbert Chappelle, I hope I'm saying that right, Distinguished Poet for North Carolina. Without further ado, Keith Flynn. Hey everyone, nice to have you uh, here. I'm glad that you've joined up with us. Uh, we do have a good many uh, folks that have signed up. Um, and so if you notice that your video has been turned off, uh, the webmaster is turning videos off because we have so many people that have joined that he wanted to make sure that we retain our bandwidth and we didn't have any problems with the Zoom app uh, by having uh, uh, too many screens on at the same time. So if that happens, that's what's going on. Um, um, also, I'm coming to you tonight from uh, White Rock Hall. Um, White Rock Hall is a church that uh, I purchased that was originally built in 1909. Um, I bought the church and we picked it up and moved it uh, to the top of this mountain. Uh, we jacked it up 18 feet. We built a first floor under it. Then we dropped the church down on top of that first floor. And in the sanctuary, we have a studio where, is, where I am now. Uh, I'm actually sitting at the pulpit um, and uh, addressing you. And uh, the White Rock sign you see above my head was the old sign for the church where it used to sit. And um, so we do a show called Live at White Rock Hall uh, where we bring in nationally known authors. We pair them with regional musicians and then we film the collaborations live. You can see all of those shows and interviews and much, much more at live at whiterockhall.com. Um, I hope all of you will visit there and become a subscriber. Again, that's live at whiterockhall.com. Um, I'm going to address you today. Much of what I'm going to talk about can be found in this book. This is uh, The Rhythm Method, Razzmatazz and Memory, How to Make Your Poetry Swing. Uh, this was originally published in 2007 by um, uh, Writer's Digest Books. And um, it was uh, Barnes and Noble's, uh, they chose it as their national notable book for National Poetry Month that year. And uh, Press 53 has picked it up for part of their Carolina Classic Series. And now it's been done in a, a new edition. And you can purchase that from uh, any, anywhere books are sold, but also from Press 53. Um, Today we're talking about the music of poetry. We're gonna talk about the sonic architect architecture of poetry, but much of my commentary today can be used for any kind of writing. Um, writing should be musical and it should be, um, in my opinion, um, it should have a great dynamism in its sound and very dense. I try to write sentences that are very dense with information. And one of the ways to transmit that information is through rhythm. Um, poetry is what the world wants when its heart is broken. Um, poetry is what um, we use. It's our highest form of expression. When we, people talk about poetry and they say, oh my goodness, that was pure poetry, or um, that's our greatest compliment, or that athlete, that was poetry in motion. We don't have uh, an expression for anything that den denotes a greater um, apprehension of beauty, um, the actual garnering of beauty in our eyes and in our ears. And poetry is what we use uh, to bury our loved ones. Poetry is what we do, what we use when we get married, um, when we um, bury our loved ones, when we pledge allegiance to the state. Um, I believe that children um, acquire language and learn language to tell the lessons that are already within them, that there's a tribal DNA and there's a great amount of stories inside children that are looking for they, when they first begin to form sounds in their mouth, they're looking to get language because they want to tell these stories that are already churning around inside the, uh, the forceful 
uh, redemptive force of their imagination. Um, so what poetry is language with a shape and uh, that language has to have in it a tremendous amount of sonic architecture and sound. Um, when, um, when you first start to write a poem or you first start thinking about it, I believe you should compose in a flood and edit in a trickle. Compose in a flood and edit in a trickle. Compose in a flood because it is hard to be wise and in love at the same time. And poet, making poetry to me is an act of love. And so many folks, when you start to, to make poetry, I believe you shouldn't have anything that uh, holds you back from the making of that, to allow all of your emotional content to be expressed. Um, and um, well, poetry is a, is a long piece of angular, hungry momentum that is flying headlong down the page. Um, it moves through that white negative space and there should be nothing that impedes that flow. Poetry has to flow with authority. And that authority is its rhythm. Um, now, in a poem, there are tremendous amounts of decisions that have to be made all the time. There are thousands and thousands of decisions. And um, the, um, the ancient Greeks used to have what they call the singer's temple. And I like to think of these decisions and, uh, in, in, a, in a similar manner. Uh, when you go to a place, if there's an impediment in a poem, typically they're either psychological or they're technical. Technical impediments to the flow of a poem are pretty easy to figure out. And you can, and we'll, we'll address some of those as we move through these, my commentary. But um, psychological impediments are much more difficult to eradicate because Psychological impediments are, um, they're emotional and they, they are sacred to the reader. Um, learning to edit requires having a cold-blooded instinct and we have to kill all of our sacred cows. Um, the ancient Greeks used to have what I talked about as a singer's temple. And they were sort of like uh, gazebos in the south. And when you would be going down and traveling down a road in ancient Greece and there would be a fork in the road and in the middle of that fork would be sitting one of these little gazebo type structures. And you would go in and you would sit and pray to whatever God you believed in at the time. And hopefully you would get some enlightenment and it would, you would continue, once you got an answer, continue on your way down the road. I think every poem is filled with hundreds, even thousands of these little singers temples where you have to go in and you make decisions based on the information at hand again, either technical or um, psychological. Um, and one of the hardest things to get folks to let go of are their psychological um, attachments, or um, especially young writers, but writers of all ages, um, when you begin to lose your objectivity, uh, you lose your objectivity because um, you're unwilling to let go of some of those sacred cows. Um, and that's, um, that I believe starts to, uh, really sort of separate the professionals and the amateurs because, I, I, one of the things that an amateur writer does is spend a lot of time talking about what they're going to write and not actually writing. Professional writers know how hard it is and they, they're consistently writing every day. Um, also what separates the amateur from the professional is the idea that, um, you have to um, be very, very hard on yourself and get rid of anything that smacks of cliche, anything that uh, any piece of writing or a sentence or a fragment of a sentence that you think you have heard somewhere before, then you have to eradicate that from your poem. Because the reader's looking for beautiful astonishments. We're looking for things that we haven't seen or heard before. And we have to learn to listen as writers. Um, so that before we can actually create. Learning to listen, um, listening might even be the most powerful of all of our senses. The Buddhists talk about learning to listen may take a thousand years. Um, and Emerson talked about um, we listen so that we may create. And Thoreau, being a really great acolyte of Emerson's, also said, 
sound brings us to our, all of our senses. Um, and so one of the ways, many of the things we're going to talk about is how do you create dynamism and sound in a poem? Now, let's go back to my first initial commentary where I was talking about um, composing a flood, edit in a trickle. We know that poetry is language with a shape. And the way that that language assimilates itself into the reader is through our sense of rhythm, through the musicality of the sentences. Um, there's a lot of times where um, poetry also causes us to, sh to, to wipe the dust off of our lenses of the everyday. Uh, the routines that we have every day uh, poetry cleans those lenses and shows us things that we take for granted in the world or we haven't seen before. There are lots of times when you're walking down a road and there's a house there or a beautiful structure that you've walked past a hundred times, but all of a sudden, for the first time, you look there and you see it in front of you. And um, you think, how did I miss that? What, what, what changed today that allowed me to see that? Um, a poem should do that in our lives over and over and over again. Um, and it's really the right words in the right order, lending light. Um, Mark Twain used to say that the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and lightning bug. Um, Twain said lots of interesting things. Uh, one of the other things he said, grab a cat by the tail and you'll learn things that you can discover no other way. Um, Twain also said, and I hold this one near and dear to my heart, um, I uh, belong to no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. And um, so finding the right words in the right order, um, once you've begun to form your poem, let's say you've poured out all of the information, you've um, allowed yourself to um, put everything down, you've started to form the poem into stanzas, and you're trying to figure out what your, how your line break should lay. Um, and when I talk about editing in a trickle, what I'm talking, uh, in some ways, Ezra Pound had a form of editing that I think is very uh, um, um, valuable to our discussion. Um, he said that once you had everything that you thought you wanted to do, you had your line breaks in place, you'd, you'd, you'd move the, po the lines into stanzas, um, or maybe not stanzas, you'd figured out how you wanted the poem to, to find its way headlong down the page, and that long, hungry momentum uh, moving through that white space, what Hem uh, Hemingway called the white bull that he had to confront every day. Um, then you, you start at the beginning of the poem, and you take away the first line, you read the poem as if the first line never existed, and if it doesn't affect the sound or the sense of the poem, then that line has got to go away. And you examine the poem for every single uh, line. You go line by line in the poem, and every single line has to um, um, hold its own. It has to, um, again, if its omission does not change the sound or the sense of the poem, then it has to be eradicated. Uh, and then you observe every stanza for the worthiness of the lines. Um, Theodore Redke said that every single poem, every line in every poem should, should resemble a poem itself, which is an incredibly high bar um, for a poem. I mean, I don't know that anybody can actually um, do that, can actually uh, make a poem where every line is a poem in itself, but we have to aspire. And that's the bar that we're looking for. Um, first of all, we have to read. We are what we read. Um, and we have to know where we fit into this long river of literature. Uh, for hundreds and even thousands of years, there's, a, there's literature that's been happening, that's moving past us, and we have to figure out where it is that our voice and our work fits into that flow. Um, what, do we, what are we able to bring to the table that's different from anybody else? And how do we access those particular talents of our own? Um, 
So we started out, we're talking about the flow. We are talking about how do you uh, line by line, uh, you decide whether or not each line has earned its place in the poem. Um, and then you begin to take those away. Um, poetry is language with a shape. So once you begin to figure out what lines you wanna take away, then you have to start examining the poem for its particular sounds. Um, and one of the ways I do this, I will sometimes write to, to a, a metronome. Um, having a metric regularity sometimes will allow me to work on a poem and to try to find the one whereby as a musician, I think about the one all the time because as, as much as I hate to admit it, being a singer myself, um, the drummer is the guy that's essentially ruling the roost in every, po in every performance that you have with a band. And a band is only as good as its drummer uh, because a lot of times, um, you know, there's not just timekeeping, but dynamism, the ability to make the sound bigger or smaller, depending on the, the way the, the drummer is driving the train. And also you have to examine um, the poems, not only for its metric regularity, but you think about the poem in um, the context of its, um, the proximity of sounds. Sound loves proximity. And many times when a poem is a little clunky or it's not got a flow, um, it's because that the sounds, the uh, alliteration of the consonants, the repetition of those initial sounds have, are, are pushed too far apart. And simply by uh, eradicating the prepositions or um, the prepositional phrases, um, you can, you can begin to, uh, or, or adjectives also, L-Y verbs sometimes will, will begin to bog the poem down. Um, it's almost like grace notes. Prepositional phrases are almost like grace notes. In the, with the, of thy, um, and those grace notes are real easy to fall into a habit of putting into your poem because they create this sort of artificial music and it's taking place in the sentences. But what they actually do is they push the um, object of the poem and the, the verb, which is the action of the, uh, of the poem or the line of the poem, farther apart from one another. The further they are apart from one another and the further apart the actual like sounds are from one another, that flattens the poem out. It doesn't allow it to have the dyna dynamic range that it's really looking for. Um, so that's the next thing you want to look at. You want to look at, um, all right, if the line is not feeling dynamically uh, um, powerful, because you got to remember, uh, the page is a cold bed. Poetry has to live in the air. The page is a cold bed. Poetry has to live in the air. One of the things that I do, besides using a metronome, is I will have a um, cassette player. For those uh, of you who are young enough that don't remember cassettes that are sitting at this workshop, um, they, they still exist. You can find some of them. Uh, they've gone the way of the VHS tape. Um, but um, they, uh, I've got a cassette player. I'll sit it in the middle of my office or the sanctuary if I'm working the sanctuary where I happen to be writing. And I'll put that tape on and I'll walk around and around that table. And I'll quote that poem over and over out loud so that I can judge the sonic quality of the poem as I'm, as I'm actually composing it. Um, and listening, listening to the poem and listening to the lines as they move against one another is one of the most important things that you can do as you, as you compose. Um, um, and you, you get better at it the more you do it. Uh, writing muscle is a lot like any other muscle. Uh, you have to train it. Uh, as a singer, I have to train my voice. I have to breathe a certain way. I breathe out of my abdomen. Uh, where do I place the note? whether it's in my glottal range or it's in my throat, um, whether it's in my nasal passage, wherever I put those notes allow me to have more breath or power or control. The same thing happens with a poem in that you have to know um, how the, you want to control the line and how the sounds should work toward one another to achieve your aim. Poems are made of words, not ideas. Poems are made of words, not ideas. 
ideas flow from the words, but words are very powerful. To me, words are like atoms. The more pressure you put them under, the more, uh, and that's where we talk, we're going to talk about condensation. Uh, poetry works because it is small uh, subset of language, but that subset of language is been put under tremendous pressure. Um, words have to carry more weight because there's fewer sentences. And as a consequence, it's the same thing as a re radioactive um, um, sort of uh, combustion takes place. If you put the words under enough pressure, if you pressurize those words enough, it's like the pressure you put under an atom, which eventually becomes explosive. Um, and learning to, you know, taking the practice you need to do is um, you have to set aside a place every day. I would encourage each of you, when I was living in Nashville and I was a songwriter, I'm still a songwriter, uh, still writing songs and still working on songs, but um, I feel like that the, my songwriting has always been an outgrowth of my poetry, that I'm constantly making poetry, uh, the prose or the essays or the novels, I'm writing two novels right now and a biography of the actor Rip Torn. Um, all of that is an outgrowth of the natural writing that takes place every day. That I started writing when I was 19 years old. I just turned 58 on the 4th of August. And so for 40 years, um, I've been finding a way every day to go to the well, to try to figure out how to, how to create more work, but how to make the work better. Um, Jack Nicholas was playing. There's a ball that's in the rough. He's out right next to the green and it's in the gallery. And they separate the gallery and Nicholas addresses his ball and he hits the ball uh, and it hits the flag and drops into the hole. And somebody in the gallery goes, lucky shot. Nicholas turns around to the gallery and he says, the more I practice, the luckier I get. Um, I'm of the belief that if you want to find lightning, the best way to do that is to find yourself a golf cart, cover it in antennas and go riding into the storm. You have to go looking for the lightning. You can't wait for inspiration to strike. Um, inspiration will come, but inspiration comes, chance favors the prepared mind. And if you have seeded the field, if you have um, um, trenched it properly and it is ready to receive inspiration, then you're going to actually have a healthy place in the redemptive force of your own imagination for that work to take seed and to flower. Um, and I believe it takes, it, you have to do it every day. I think you have to go to the well every day. Um, when I was in Nashville, I started to say a second ago, and I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you, but uh, that's, that's the way I do it. Um, and uh, when I was in Nashville, I used to have, we, uh, when I, I hung out with some songwriters, um, including Mickey Newberry and, uh, I met Willie Nelson while I was there, and there were several others. Um, and uh, we talk, I talked about a uh, hook book. In other words, having a book that you carry around with you all the time, that you put hooks in, that you put um, memorable phrases that could end up in a poem or memorable phrases that could end up being hooks for a song, um, like the Garth Brooks song, uh, one of a kind, work two of a kind, two of a kind, working on a full house. Um, hearing little phrases like that, Jonathan Williams was one of the great found poets that I ever saw because Jonathan was always looking in the world and finding these phrases and writing them down in his hook book and um, finding a place for them later when he went and started working on his writing at night. Um, all right. Now, thinking about sound, as you start to break the lines down, as you start to move through the poem, we've already started the editing process of moving whole lines out of uh, our uh, composition. Um, and one of the things you want to think about is the beats. In some ways, you are like a, a, a train, you're like a conductor, or you're like a, a, a somebody that's working on a track, and you have a... Um, lantern and you're walking down in front of the train and you're waving this lantern for the reader's train of thought and you want to you want to direct that reader at a left right side uh stop but you want to do that by your line breaks 
and by your punctuation. Typically, um, a line break is a half beat. It just takes a half beat for the reader's eye to go to the end of the line and then begin the, 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 the front of the next line. Um, also, uh, a comma you have to look at is a half beat. A period is a full stop, so that's a full beat. Um, um, apostrophes, uh, full stop. Um, there's, there are way, and A.R. Ammons was the great king of the apostrophes, uh, or the colon, I should say. Um, um, apostrophes are a whole different animal. I'm thinking of a colon and a semicolon. Um, a colon is a full stop, but a semicolon will be a half stop. So you have to be thinking about this because you're directing the reader's train of thought and their rhythm is uh, completely dependent on how you direct them. Um, one of the things I don't like very much are hyphens. I feel like uh, hyphens are the most promiscuous of all punctuation marks. Uh, they'll hook up with anything. And uh, they really don't allow you to do anything except create these. Also, they can create grace notes, these two beat grace notes where they link two words together. Um, there's a time and a place for them if, if that's what your intention is. But sometimes by doing that, um, you create these, these, these false um, sort of counterfeit illusory places for the reader's eye to travel to as opposed to moving straight across the words themselves. Um, and then we want to get into uh, thinking about condensation. Now, I already talked about the beginning of condensation is learning to what to take away. Um, but also, one of the things I think you want to do is you want to um, try to get each sentence as active as possible. One of the ways to do that is to, after you've uh, put the poem down, you've put as much of yourself as you know how, the information into the poems, you've eradicated the prepositions and the gerunds, um, you've begun to fashion the lines in a manner that you, that you like, you're changing the punctuation of the lines, um, then you want to think about um, how to break the lines, but how to also use the negative space, because the negative space in a poem is very, very important. What do you do with the silence between the lines or that black or that white space that creates the, the space for the reader's eye to travel to? Because that also takes up time for that to happen. Um, and uh, that, that sonic space is silence. Um, Louis Armstrong's talked about the, how to use the silence in his performances. He wanted to get so quiet, he said, that the audience could hear a rat in the wall pissing on cotton. And you want to get to a place where you use the, the, the silence in the poem itself. And also, when you're um, reading a poem, one of the things that you want to do is think about that silence as well and use it. If you're giving a reading and you think the reading is not going well, the best thing for you to do is stop. Most folks, when they read and they feel like it's going badly, they want to speed up, speed up, speed up, and get and, and make it go faster. The, they think that the quicker I can get off the stage, the better it's going to work. The best thing you can do is stop, reset, and then begin to think about the work in a much slower, much more deliberate manner. Force the, re, the audience's ear to, to pay attention to you and allow all the work that you've put into the poem to do its thing, um, because you've, you've already created this, this whole sonic composition, you have to figure out a way to allow the audience to fully experience that and not blow through all of the beautiful decisions that you've made through the poem, but allow them to settle. Um, one of the ways to, um, to make that more interesting is to examine every single piece for uh, action, every single verb for action, because there's lots of ways that you can take um, uh, verbs and make them more dynamic by, I would I, whenever I write anything, I examine all the verb choices and then see if I can put something in that's more active uh, uh, or has, or illustrates more of the motion that I'm trying to create. Um, and, you know, people are mortified when they're reading poems. I, I understand that. Um, when uh, 
Polls are taken all the time and they ask what are the things that people are most afraid of. The number one fear of people over and over and over is not death, although you would think it would be, it's their fear of speaking in public. Overwhelmingly number one choice. So if you logically think about that and take that to its logical uh, extreme, that means that most people at a funeral would rather be uh, in the box than giving the eulogy, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you're more afraid of dying than you are of, uh, you're more afraid of standing there and talking in front of a crowd than you are dying. Um, which seems a, rid a ridiculous concept on the face of it. But um, getting comfortable also requires you being comfortable with the way you look or the way you speak. Um, when I was younger, I used to speak in front of a mirror. Uh, I would, not only would I recite my poems to get them um, to, to create um, uh, the sonic uh, architecture or the composition that I, so, that I wanted to, to be foremost, but after that also to what did I look like when I stood in front of the crowd moving my mouth? What, what did I want to present to the crowd? And I think that's something everybody could, to, could um, benefit from, thinking about what you want to do. Because every poetry performance is a bit like a play. Um, it's a bit like a, a, a dramatic monologue given by an actor. Uh, but except you're not acting, you're reading your poetry, but you're giving a performance. And that's very, very important. I think uh, everybody should think about it um, with that sort of, that, that, that sense of um, achievement or that sense of dra dramatic effect and use the space, use the quiet for uh, dramatic effect and, for the, and allow the more powerful parts of the poem, the more, because we're trying to make poems that are muscular. We want them to be as muscular and dynamic and, and sonically rich as possible. Um, okay, now, uh, let's talk a little bit about condensation. One of the things that we can do is, um, um, I told you to look for the active verbs. We talked about line breaks because line breaks also, depending on where you break them, I typically think that it's better to break a line on a noun um, as opposed to uh, a verb because if you go to a noun, typically that, that forces the reader not to hurry back to the next line, but they, it forces them to think about the image that has just uh, taken place. And so they don't, it doesn't force them to rush quickly to the next line. And if the, and if the verb uh, follows closely on the noun choice, then, the, then there's gonna be a, a little pickup for the next line because there's action taking place. So the noun breaks, you move to the next line, and then there's action, and the churn of the poem starts again. Action verbs are the little turbans that churn the action and move that momentum down the page. Uh, always try to find as many active verbs as possible. Or if, if you can, look for and use a noun as a verb. Um, for instance, um, there's a, listen, listen to this poem. Um, this is a poem by a poet I know named Stephen Roberts. The poem is called Sex, very short. Each love creates its own final cause. Crimson, orange, pink and violet wisps arch behind the oak and pine draped mountains, distant unseen slope. The gray, creaky, board warped dock projects from the reed rimmed shore into the spectral lake. Leaves sink surface to sediment while unending wind driven waves maple out into the darkness. The idea of having the, the, the noun maple being used as a verb is a little unexpected astonishment for the reader at the end of that poem. And I loved it every time I saw it. Um, there's another poet that I love, whose name is Laureen Niedeker. L-O-R-I-N-E-N-I-E-D-E-C-K-E-R, Lorene Niedeker. Um, when I edited in 19, uh, 2000, I put out a, a special issue of the Asheville Poetry Review. I've been editing the review for since 1994, 26 years we've been at it. 
And um, in 2000, we put out a special millennial issue choosing 10 great neglected poets of the 20th century. One of those was Laureen Niedeker, um, an amazing um, poet who talked about constantly every day going to her condensary. And um, uh, I love her short poems. And um, here's one where she takes and uses a noun and substitutes it as a verb. Popcorn can cover screwed to the wall over a hole so the cold can't mouse in. Popcorn can cover screwed to the wall over a hole so the cold can't mouse in. Um, it's another place where um, we can almost make us see the cold as it sticks its nose into every crevice of the house. And, um, and there, it makes us think in that little poem of the cold as a pervasive foe uh, that you're constantly trying to keep out of the house um, that's flowing all around you. And uh, she animates that poem by her choice of that unexpected verb. Um, so um, I think that, um, you know, it's pretty easy to be lazy if you're a writer and you just use the first thought, best thought. That's not true. It's never been true. Um, and editing, I think, separates uh, professionals from amateurs. Um, and I think, you know, to, to be a poet when you're 20 is to be 20. Uh, to be a poet when you're 50 is to be a poet. Um, and it takes time to discover what your voice will be and what your aesthetic philosophy will be. Um, and you don't have to rush it. You know, you don't, uh, you know, trying to, trying to teach somebody how to write poetry is a little bit like trying to assemble an instruction manual for a sunset. Um, there are so many arbitrary and um, meaningful things that are beyond your control. But the things that are within your control, you have to you have to keep as tight a grip on those as a maker as you can. Um, all right. Um, one of the things, uh, another, uh, I talked about Hemingway a minute ago, talking about Hemingway and his idea of the white space, the white bull that he had to confront every day as a writer. Um, but Hemingway can also be read for economy. Um, you know, he, he doesn't uh, waste space, he doesn't waste words, and uh, I've discovered that poets who have not read Hemingway before find him very useful um, uh, in his economy. Uh, one time there was, there was an um, interview with Hemingway, and they asked him, they said, um, how many, I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, use the fewest words possible, Mr. Hemingway, um, how many words does it take to tell a story? And he goes, he stood there for a minute and he rubbed his chin and he said, um, I think six. I think I can tell a story with six words. And uh, the uh, interviewer stepped back for a second and he goes, consider this. And he said, for sale, baby shoes, never used. For sale, baby shoes, never used. Um, I find that taking and setting a limit for myself um, allows me, like there are certain poems that I have where I've, I've done it three times where I, every single line has six words in it. The entire poem, there's six words in every line. Um, whether or not you can actually accomplish that, it's a good exercise to take. Um, a lot of times you can uh, jumpstart your creative process if you're having a hard time getting started in your, in your setting every night. Um, by figuring out a way to jumpstart the process by um, um, you setting yourself a, a, a specific goal of, or the amount of beats in a line. Sometimes you can do it by using descriptive language. Take a single object, begin to describe it, and slowly but surely out of your descriptions, you'll find yourself working on a piece. Whether it's ekphrastic or not, you're already beginning to work, you make your mind work, and the description will take you somewhere else. Um, and that's, that's also a way to get you spreading, you know, get you spreading and thinking about, um, thinking of the words as notes 
and that you have that, and thinking about the, the variety of the colors. Um, Picasso said that all art is the elimination of the unnecessary. And one of the ways you get rid of the, the unnecessary things are to examine them closely for what you want the poem to stand for. And sometimes that requires an abiding image, that there's an image in the center of the poem as sort of like a column in the middle of the room. And you repeat that image in a manner that allows the, that, that single image to be the column in the poem that's slowly turning, but it's holding up the entire structure. Um, but um, I think it was real good that uh, you, you want to begin a poem in action and leave it in motion. Begin it in action and leave it in motion. In other words, you want the reader to enter your poem and whatever action is already taking place, you want it to already be taking place. You don't want any explication. You don't want to slowly try to tell, persuade the reader to come into the poem and do what you want them to. You want the action to take place in such a manner that they join the action. And then at the end, if you think about that abiding image, you can leave the poem in motion by sometimes allowing a single, very powerful image to happen at the end of the poem hang in the air and allow that poem to move and, and enter into the reader's body in such a way that they maybe they didn't get the lessons the poem had to teach but the image that single image is so unforgettable that it begins to work them and work in their uh, subconscious in such a manner that they can't get rid of it. Uh, a lot of times if you see a piece of art that you think is spectacular um, at the time, or even more importantly, you see one that's not so spectacular, but you can't get it out of your mind. Suddenly, everything you see throughout the day begins to resemble that piece of art. That means it's gotten into your body. And there are poems all over the world that are slithering around the ash cans, that are coming through the trees in this forest, that are uh, going down alleyways, and they're trying to find the readers that they were meant for. And they do that slowly but surely by assimilating rhythmically into the world experience, the world view, and uh, the rhythm of that reader as they, as they confront that poem for the first time. All right, I know we're moving quick and we're getting toward the end. Um, I want to do, I want to talk a minute about editing. I've been an editor um, for a long time. Um, uh, 26 years I've been editing the literary journal and um, I want to read you something from uh, the rhythm method, razzmatazz and memory, how to make your poetry swing. Everything I've talked about today is in this book. Um, it's a manifesto, it's a history lesson, it's an anthology. Um, everything that I know probably is in this book and um, one of the things that I wrote about was uh, editing. Uh, and there's a whole chapter about uh, how the editor uh, views the poems that are presented to them. And I think all editing is subjective, which is why I don't send back rejection letters. I send reaction letters. Um, uh, I, I don't call them rejection letters. I can't reject the poem. I, I don't, I, I can only react to the poem and decide whether or not um, it, it meets the aesthetic, uh, principles that I myself have as an editor to get into my journal. And it doesn't matter if the, I don't like the subject matter or I don't like uh, the style or what have you. If it's good, it gets in, period. Um, so all editing is subjective. When we place ourselves in the hands of an editor, no amount of background, biography, or back slapping will help them decide to publish or reject a poem. There is only the poem in front of them and it is as naked or sophisticated as the day it was born. The decision an editor makes in those moments is as arbitrary as possible, and yet it contains a million other factors, dependent upon his or her mood, the weather, the amount of work they have to do, the themes of the issue, conscious and unconscious stylistic bias, their last meals, agreeable digestion, the time that it took to read the mountain of poems in the first place, their child's piano lesson, the lack of a title, the length of a title, the worth of the first line, the color of the paper stock, the unmitigated gall to send a multi-page biography, the fact that it's another damn sonnet, 
the fact that it's the perfect damn sonnet, the lack of a shower, bravado, pitch, vocabulary, humility, sweep, vision, humor, shape, rhetoric, form, diction. The action of the editor, editor however confusing to the, the poets, is riveted with love. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. The best poems stop us in our tracks, they shut us up, they make us read the poem again and again because it has suddenly opened another room in our brain that was hidden to us before. I've been submitting my own poetry to other editors for their appraisal since I was 18 years old. And I know from firsthand experience the pain of that reaction letter. So I treat prospective contributors the way that I want to be treated myself. And I hope my process bears the quality of tenderness. Um, all right, um, really quick, I'm gonna go down, I have a portion in here that's called 15 Rules to Write By. Um, and um, since poetry, uh, I think Kafka said, art is the ax which with, with which I break open the frozen sea within myself. Art is the ax with which I break open the frozen sea within myself. Um, I wrote 15 rules to write by in this book, and we're going to go quickly down them. Um, always allow your true nature to be expressed and apply no limitations to your beginning flow. Let come what may, as much as possible. The road of excess, said William Blake, leads us to the palace of wisdom. Inspiration is fleeting. Technique is eternal. Number three, compose aloud. Poetry is a sound. Number four, music is the universal language because it is mathematical and you always want to know the number of beats in your lines, the number of lines that want to be a stanza. Number five, never fall back on cliche or use any metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech that you have ever seen in print. Cliche is the death of good writing and it's lazy. Uh, so a lazy salesman is really easy for a prospective client to see through. A lazy writer is just as easy to see through. Uh, number six, never use a long word when a short one will do. Scientific terms are rarely short, but have their purpose if they don't have to be explained. Never explain, my friends. Never apologize, never withdraw. Number seven, examine every sentence for more active verbs. Never use the passive when you can use the active. Number eight, clear your poem of abstractions. Never use an abstract concept when a concrete image will do. No ideas, said Dr. Williams, but in things. No ideas, but in things. Number nine, fear gerunds, participle, participles, I'm sorry, fear gerunds, participles, adjectives that bleed your nouns of energy. Beware the artificial music of prepositional phrases. Remove them when you can. Remember when I talked about grace notes earlier in our, my comments. Give a poem the distance to speak clearly and never send a new poem to be published. Compose in a flood. Edit in a trickle. Be muscular. Cut every word you possibly can and realize that every line is a muscle in the body of the poem. Be muscular. Less is more. Condensation is the final frontier and you must admit no impediment. The poem must flow with authority, remove all obstacles, technical, psychological, or musical, and remember that rhythm loves proximity. Balance all sounds for greatest impact. Variance in rhythm creates surface tension, propulsion, and momentum. Start that poem with action and leave it in motion. All right, I think we're ready to take some uh, can't think of anything else that I want to try to get you said to you today in this amount of time. I think at this point, uh, you had said earlier that you'd like to take a few um, questions, and I'm, I'm very happy to do that now, if you guys would like to do that. Are you with me? I wanted to ask, will you be reading anything of yours? Um, 
I certainly can do that. I was trying to do as much uh, teaching as possible today, but I can uh, I can read a poem if if, that's, if everybody had rather I read a poem than answer questions. I'm happy to do that. Well, I would, but um, I, I don't know how the others feel. Do you have? Uh, do you guys have any? Uh, others have questions. I'll, I'll, how about? I take a few questions and then I'll finish with a poem. How would that be? Anybody else have a question? Um, two people have said, yes, read, please. Read, please. But <laughs> okay. Anybody um, have a question, sing out quick. <laughs> um, okay. Anybody else have a, a question that they want to ask? I have one question. Please go ahead. Uh, is there much difference between the original Rhythm and Razzmatazz book and the new edition? There's no, there's no difference whatsoever. Um, no. It's, it's exactly the same. Um, it's just been put into a, uh, I mean, even the cover, everything you could, you probably, the, other than having Press 53's uh, logo on it, that would be the only difference. Um, so there's there's no change whatsoever. So uh, please um, feel free. Um, my guess is most of the copies that are on Amazon may be maybe the the first edition, but uh, the second edition uh, you couldn't tell any difference um, whatsoever. The, the same cover, everything. Um, this is my new book of poetry. It's called The Skin of Meaning. Uh, it's published by Red Hen Press. Yes, that is the Picasso on the cover. <laughs> it's blue period. And um, this book just came out in um, April. And um, I would love it if uh, you guys went from this place and went to Red Hen Press and purchased this book. You are, and I love that you have that book. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> uh, and um, anybody else have a question? Oh, Mary Ellen. I didn't realize till I just saw that was your uh, your name. Hey, Mary, that's, this is the first time we've ever seen each other. So nice <laughs> to see you. Um, anybody else have a question? All right. If not, then I'm going to read a couple of poems. Um, I know I, I my my workshops are very dense with information and. Um, uh, I move very quickly. Um, it's just the way I do it. I, I like. I feel like. Um, people ought to get as much bang for their buck as they can get. And so this amount of time, let's try to get as many ideas uh, out as possible. Um, this is a uh, uh, poem uh, by uh, this poem actually happened on a plane flight. The Paul, Mo Paul Motion is a drummer um, and a great jazz drummer uh, who played with Stan Getz and many other famous uh, uh, jazz players. And I rode on a plane with him from Chicago to New York one time. We had a conversation that stayed in my mind for 25 years. This is called Like a Buddha. When Paul Motion played drums, he seemed hardly there. A swish, a stir. And then with the whimsy of a ghost slowly rising from the vent, Several frozen colors came splashing rapidly down, like flushed birds in the distance. It's the sound an exploding dandelion might make if it were made of tin, when all else stopped, and mm -hmm. strained at its bit, listening for him. I support the band, he asserted. I am an accompanist, there to make it happen, not to linger. Like when I made Monk twirl, he said, stirring the air with his finger. What else is there? He shrugs. He plays with his teeth. I know that a far greater country exists, he asserts. I have set my foot down on it. Many rhythms occurring all at once. Layers of strings. His eyebrows sting and sharpen. Why ask? He is restful and folds his hands one inside another. I know, 
there are perfectly good explanations for all the simultaneous risks we juggle. There are shipyards of baubles and harbors that have dried up and martinis made up by Episcopalians that burnish them for the plagiarisms of the Holy Spirit. It's only right that the room where music occurs to be furnished with importance and low light, it got to flaunt the groove with flourishes and gentle force, I guess. Like a Buddha, Paul Motion says. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, is there, uh, I'm going to, if there, we don't have any more questions, I'll read one more poem and then we'll, uh, we'll end this session. Uh, if there are any more questions, though, I'm happy to take any questions you guys want to give me. Um, and uh, I'll read, uh, and I'll read one more poem to take us out. Anybody? Um, all right, this is, um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to do a poem since I'm still, since today our, our focus is primarily on music. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Louie and the Wolf. Mm -hmm. um, this is a poem. Um, I had a dream actually one time that I thought that I saw Louis Armstrong and Howling Wolf on the same stage. <laughs> I went and checked uh, YouTube because, of course, if it's not on YouTube, it couldn't possibly have happened. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't see that. And so I've, I've never seen any piece of information that said that they actually happened. So instead, I created my own theater and they are in it. Um, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to sing a little piece of blues and then I'm going to take us into the poem, if that's all right with you. And I'll try not to blow everybody's heads off when I try to when I sing a little bit here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push I'm gonna take my voice back a little bit. Um, so we're gonna sing a little, then we're gonna join this poem. It's called Louie and the Wolf. Whoa, I asked the girl for water. And whoa, she gave me gasoline. And whoa, I asked the girl for water. And whoa, she gave me gasoline. Now that's the terriblest woman I damn near ever see. I have come to wonder if Louis Armstrong and the wolf ever met, what a sight that would be. A grand summit meeting complete with growling, wolf licking his harp and Satchmo grinning away, deftly fingering his horn in an effort to curtail the sonic boom of the two most powerful voices ever gathered in the walls of a single room, snarling and stalking that elegant whisper, I imagine Wolf laying tracks and Louis so remarkably dignified, so clearly in the furrows of the groove, prowling the stage like the shadow of a storm cloud, while Wolf raged and bit down on the low chord changes like a chainsaw blade, a ragged sound refined by the shimmering honey of the Great Dipper's rising horn, so perfectly above the fray, howling, would get down on all fours, writhing around on the stage. And King Louis with his handkerchief flying like a flag on a mahogany galleon, hurtling across the choppy sea's wake. Wolf, bursting with Delta Moan and the evil ways of a tail dragger for Satan, forsaking his mother's gospel hysterics and earning her undying neglect, right up to his final deathbed when he asked, Send a letter, please, Mama. I'm dying. Please come. But she didn't. Named for a president, Chester Arthur Burnett was born under a bad sign, Haley's Comet, 
was burning across the sky like a brakeman's lantern. But a blues man will survive, staring straight into the sun like a rifle with eyes. Old Satch, he would know. His thunderous percussive purr emerging from the earth like a fountain of pent up feeling, meticulous in its placement as it repeatedly echoed the punch of the brass lines and the cymbals set to ride. His cornet weathered every swinging era, birds, heebie jeebies, and the big band's muskrat rambles, always sailing and seldom misbehaving, and not since the rancid Storyville days and the colored waifs municipal boys' home when as an eight-year-old his body was peppered black and blue with blows from the older boys until the bent child escaped via the Mississippi on a light littered steamboat. Its giant wheel, just the juju and propulsion needed to heal the nuance of a genius whose rules are its own. And those last quiet notes with the crowd so still, you could hear a rat pissing on cotton in the walls And this gleaming note, the corner of a note set to crackle, piercing the racial gloom of the American heart like buckshot, his trumpet bell uplifted and ringing. And though the rain may ooze and lovers lose their feeling, though the moon melt down and the earth finally find its ceiling in the poisoned heavens, there will be a sound overwhelming all others, a horn poised flaming in our imagination. Though the earth be smothered and fire rise a final time inside the webbing of our skin, we will be our minds boiling with the shock of recognition, bound in worship like Louis and the wolf, whose dream meeting probably never took place, though my mind cannot erase the wish of it, the sheer bliss and pitch and rich opposition that the scene presents, a listening like I have never experienced, Gears within gears, grinding until the wounds are wound together, the grace of music calming every child's feathers, arm in arm, as they and we rise and sing together here in the Gulf's fearsome swelter. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I really appreciate it. Um, if there are any questions right quick before we get off, I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, if not, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll shut it down. I think this uh, presentation is gonna be made available on the Knoxville Writers Guild website, if I understand rightly. Um, and so uh, there, if, you, if there's any friends of yours that might have missed this presentation and would like to see it, I think it's gonna be made available.